Welcome to the first blog we will discuss on research and the preserva preservation of environment. So we'll introduce uh, the people I'm with. First, uh, we have Mrs. Uh, Céline Surette. You have a doctorate in science of our environment from Université de Québec in Montreal, and you are a chemistry and biochemistry uh, professor at UDM. Invest in we have Mrs. Susan O'Donna. PhD in uh, sociology. Mm -hmm. um, you are um, you have a background in digital communication, and uh, you also uh, work with uh, well, you are with the same organization, Tracy Glynn, who you are presently working on your PhD, I believe, um, on mining, and you are a lecturer at St. Thomas University. And we'll be talking to you both at the same time in a little while. And we have uh, Janet Doucet, uh, who is the program coordinator at uh, Daily uh, Point Nature Reserve. So we're going to be, on va commencer en français. We will start in French with Mrs. Surette. So Céline, so we'll say just the first name, Céline. Céline, you, you have a project that you're you're working on a project uh, called that's a uh, Réseau Eco Network. So those who want Eco Network and uh, Réseau Eco. So Eco, it, that's the acronym. So because we talk a lot, we like in the academic uh, uh, we, Re Eco Network is a network. Eco, it's environment, community, and uh, health. it's an observatory. They look at the cumulative impact of the natural resource de development on health, environment, and on the communities. So you are a researcher. Are you the main researcher? So if I understand well, like Eco is is a project like a uh, pan-Canadian project. So this project has a goal to build the capacity so we can react to the uh, cumulative impact of natural resources uh, development. So we ha often we work in silos, like we work in the environment, health, uh, and community. But when we talk about the uh, development, it's important to take all those pieces and put them together. So the network really plays this role, like to build the, the capacity and also to develop tools and processes to help us to reach those goals. So this uh, network is uh, all over Canada. It's based on a case study. We have four, two in the British Columbia, one in Alberta, and one here in New Brunswick. So let's talk about this, because you are a researcher, you, you're responsible for the province here in New Brunswick. So just talk us uh, of New Brunswick as such. So this project, uh, in the, all the case study, we have, uh, we have a co-responsibility between university and a, a partner organization. In New Brunswick, we work with the New Brunswick Environmental Network, and the goal is really to work with different uh, partners in the province to help them to develop the tools they need to uh, break those silos and work together so they can react to the community uh, impacts. For example, for example, we will develop some tools that will uh, help us to integrate uh, health knowledge and environment in the communities with indicators. So we can take different indicators in different areas and put them together so we, so we have an idea of what's going on on the territory. So at this time, we'll be able to identify uh, areas where we could uh, develop the uh, tools or do some actions so, so we can better manage what's happening on our territory. So do you have uh, examples in particular, or, or is it uh, all the all over New Brunswick? We will act at different different level. Like we can develop like maps, like a pro, at the scale of the province to compare diff the different regions. So the Eco Network is particularly particularly very interesting in rural areas. These are areas where we will find like the industries or where we will develop uh, the, the resources. So maybe we are in a region we're not far from Meldun and. So we had the, uh, we had the mine, we, we had the smelter, we had. 
So it's, it's a heavy industry. So we, the two, we will have tools like province-wide, and we can also develop with uh, different communities. Uh, we want, we can develop tools adapted to the local context or here in the region, shall a region to understand how we can develop historically like the natural resources and how now we are in a, a, a state like in a transition stage. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there's there's a lot of hope, a lot of things happening on the territory, uh, and we can imagine like uh, uh, be like uh, otherwise. So, how we can work with people to get there to understand what happened on the territory, and see how we can go forward. And you mentioned the rural area, so that's a focus you have. But it's a rural and also a, a region who are far. Away. So you're interested? In, yes, it's an interest for us. And in some of case study, uh, especially in the British Columbia, we have a focus based on the First Nations. We're trying to take those learnings and adapt them here. So we are developing also relationships with uh, First Nations communities in New Brunswick. We did it more in southeastern New Brunswick, so we are starting to do it here in the Chalera Bay. And we talk also multidisciplinary research. So what type of uh, research? So when you introduced me, you told me like I was at the uh, chemistry, biochemistry. So my, my training is really like in uh, natural science and environmental science. So we have researchers in our neck today from social science, health science. And we have several community partners. And they are in all kinds of organization, education, and the health organization. It's to see together how we can work to better understand what's happening happening on the territory. So we need all of those uh, different uh, minds, as you say, also to break the silos, because uh, it's because we tend to work like uh, in our own field of expertise. And what is uh, what it, we need to, ha to uh, have good listening uh, skills. We need to understand a grander word we use, but sometimes we define things differently. So how between the sectors. Just cumulative impact, it's a, it's a word that's difficult to understand. So how can we work together, understand what we mean by it? So then we are able to act. So we, we have this notion in the eco network to understand what's going on, really like uh, it's geared toward action. So your project started uh, about two years and a half ago. We're about halfway to it in the project. So we got a grant for five years, and it's from the Research Institute uh, uh, in the health area in Canada. So it's a federal government, so it should end in 2022. So at the end, you will probably have uh, have some kind of uh, report. So, so what we're hoping to, to uh, we would like to leave our uh, partners with the tools they'll be able to continue their work. So we will have funding for five years, but we're hoping it will generate uh, a capacity like uh, at a Canadian scale, because here it's New Brunswick, but you have your colleagues also uh, uh, throughout Canada. So, so, uh, so there will uh, discussion here in the province and elsewhere in Canada. It's a pro it's a Canadian project, and we have colleagues in New Zealand and Australia. They're working on this project, so we will. Be benefit from their expertise and vice versa. Great thing. So if you are interested to, to know more about you, let me do a Google research. Google search. So it's eco-network-reseau-eco.ca. Thank you very much. Now we're going to speak with Susan O'Donnell, uh, who, as I said earlier, your PhD in sociology from Dublin City University. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're a principal researcher mm -hmm. with another project yes. um, called RAVEN. RAVEN, another acronym yes. that we're going to demystify right here. That's right. <laughs> it's Rural Action and Voices for the Environment. And it's, so, and it's beautiful, it, RAVEN it's, for the, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a nice, it's a nice, easy to remember word. That's right. So what we're doing, it's actually really interesting to listen to Celine because I can see a lot of similarities yeah in that we have community partners 
It's about building capacity and seeing how we can work together. So the focus of my research and my all my expertise is on digital media and communications. Mm -hmm. And when in New Brunswick, a lot of people will be aware that we have a real challenge with the media in New Brunswick. A lot of challenges, but one of the big ones is that environmental issues aren't covered properly and rural issues aren't covered properly. So the, the goal of our project is to see how we can use digital media to improve the coverage of environmental issues and rural issues in New Brunswick. And how we're doing that is we're linking up mostly with environmental activists in different rural areas and seeing how we can support them through digital media uh, to get their stories out. And that's been the focus. Yeah, yeah. and it's interesting because I've been looking at, uh, at it on the uh, NB Media. Media Co-op, co yeah. Co exactly. And you were giving uh, examples earlier uh, yeah. Uh, of, uh, yeah, well we have, we have we have three partners, the NB Media Co-op and uh, Tracy is involved with yep. that. And then we also have the Joint Economic Development Initiative, which is an organization that provides uh, training with all the Indigenous communities, the 15 Indigenous First Nations in the province. And then the third project uh, that we have as our partner, just new from last year, and we're really excited about, is the Projet On. Oh. It was putting on this event today. Exactly. So, um, Danny and Renel. Danny and Renel, yeah. We actually met them. We're all involved with the New Brunswick Environmental Network. Yes. And so it's through that and working on common projects that we decided to get involved in this event, for example. And then we're talking about other events that we can do together. We're really interested in the Baldoon area because of what um, Celine mentioned, and I think because of everyone know what knows, is that it's one of the few areas in the province where there's a concentration of uh, heavy industry, but also in a rural area. So it's quite unique that way. We have St. John, of course, which mm -hmm. is also has the oil refinery, it's heavy industry, but here we have this concentration in a rural area in such a beautiful environment, and this is this, this sort of combination of this, you know, extreme beauty, exactly. very heavy polluting industry, and very rural. And so it's a really interesting, from a research perspective, it's yes. a really interesting uh, area to look at. Well, now you mentioned Tracy, we're going mm -hmm. to go to Tracy Lynn, that where you work together on the same, so you're the principal mm -hmm. researcher and you're uh, uh, research assistant researcher, right, for the project Raven, yes. and you also are working presently on your doctorate degree, and your your topic is um, mining. Yeah, yes. so the topic of my research is uh, looking at uh, how how women are affected by mining and uh, and how they resist mining, and that's in Indonesia. But I, I also work with a number of mine affected communities here in Canada. I'm on the board of Mining Watch Canada, and we. Uh, we do work uh, here in Canada um, with communities that are affected by mining, but also uh, communities outside of Canada that are affected by Canadian mining companies. You're quite known in your in your field, uh, I, I have to say, <laughs> because every time we uh, either we discuss about things, uh, Tracy Glynn is uh, uh, known in, in your in your field of work. So, uh, but tell us about. Um, Maybe, maybe we can go back a, a little bit later about your uh, the mining situation and the uh, an interesting uh, story you told me uh, earlier. But uh, you're with Raven, same way as uh, Susan here. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about the N NB Media Co-op that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. You're quite involved with that, I believe. Yeah, so uh, the NB Media Co-op was formed uh, 11 years ago now. So. Uh, in 2008, about 200 people from across the province got together in Fredericton at, at a New Brunswick social forum. And at that event, uh, it was people who worked in all sorts of different areas, social justice activists, indigenous land defenders, uh, union leaders. Uh, um, and we all recognized that the problem that we all had in common was the media. Uh, in the province, so uh, a not group reporting, of us, yeah, not reporting our stories or yeah. the, or yeah, yeah. Um, also, yeah, misrepresenting um, certain voices, and uh, so we decided to form a, a media co-op because we also felt the co-op model was the most democratic way uh, to produce 
the stories of our lives. So yeah. we are uh, supported by a membership. Um, uh, people join the media co-op. Uh, uh, we have annual general meetings where our members get together and uh, an elected and a board. And Susan's on on the editorial board. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, and so we've. Um, We've, since then, we've been telling a number of stories that haven't been reported, uh, so, sometimes not at all, important stories, um, including uh, one here that affects this region, the, the Beldoon region, um, the, uh, where we get our coal uh, right. from Colombia. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. So, Tell uh, us about that. Yeah, so, um, so uh, yeah, about 20 years ago now, uh, I became aware of, uh, of uh, what was happening in, in Colombia with uh, communities being displaced there, indigenous Wayu and Afro-Colombian communities that were being displaced. And I had returned back uh, from living overseas and uh, returned to New Brunswick and I'd learned that uh, the MB Power plant was sourcing coal from this mine that was known around the world by, uh, you know, by people who are active on uh, on mining issues. So people were displaced in that region yeah. where, where you were in, uh, in, in Colombia, yeah. Because of the of the mine mining, and yeah. like forcefully displaced where violence was used and uh, also uh, Colombia is a very dangerous place to be a trade unionist. Uh, 3,000 union leaders have been murdered there in the last 30 years. Uh, so there's a lot of problems around uh, where uh, where MB Power is, is getting its coal and we uh, so the MB Media Cup has been reporting on a number of those stories. We report on, uh, we have people from uh, the affected communities, the mine workers come to Fredericton uh, to meet with MB Power officials. We report on that. We report on if there's strikes in the communities. Uh, uh, so that's one example of how the media, the other media has not been covering no, it yeah. at all. And uh, But uh, to just to make a, a qu side note regarding uh, MB Power and all that, but you did how so people are listening know that you made them aware of that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. They, they took action. Oh yeah. So okay. uh, it's important to yeah, mention. Yeah, for sure. And we know that uh, the the one time actually that the um, uh, the Fredericton Daily Gleaner, the the Irving owned paper, uh, did cover it was when we, we decided to do a spectacle outside the MP Power office when we had a, a guest uh, from Colombia meeting with the, the, the CEO of MB Power at the time. Um, so that actually, at the, because of the, that spectacle outside where uh, some street theater was done that showed uh, the, uh, a theater around uh, evicting a community. And so the media um, you know, took footage of that and then asked MB Power what actions they were gonna take. So then uh, our demand at the time was that the uh, that MB Power write to the coal mining company and request that the, the company bargain in good faith with the, the mine workers yeah. who were currently negotiating, at that time, sorry, were negotiating a And so a at least they, they did. And they did they, do that. Yeah. With and your help and yeah. your guidance, I yeah. guess. But, uh, but that, I think, shows, because the media also called, that shows like the importance of the media holding public uh, officials like MB Power to account. It shows, uh, like I just think about if we did have investigative journalism, whether uh, you know these problems would be occurring at all, mm. um, whether we would have you know, um, uh, yeah, whether the the people in, in Colombia who are affected by um, uh, by our consumption of coal, whether you know th those problems would be happening at all, and yeah. uh, so it just shows the importance of the media. For sure, and so people who are interested to know about uh, more, uh, they can go. I googled um, and and the media yeah. co-op, yeah. and uh, and it just came up so yeah. uh, quite easily. Yeah. You also have uh, Raven uh, Tire, Raven uh, Tire Research Hyphen. <laughs> hyphen. Merci. <laughs> Raven uh, Raven hyphen research dot org for That's more right. information, mm -hmm. and f also for the NV Media. And you never know, yeah, maybe people will yeah. uh, come involved. And yes, uh, we encourage people to not just become members of their local media co-op, but also to write the stories of their right. lives. Yeah. So the whole point that we started this project. Um, some of us do have journalism backgrounds. Some of us don't. We just learned. Uh, we learned with the. the journalist. I was going to say, uh, yes, yeah. uh, to, to finish on that, mm -hmm. uh, is there some kind of uh, editorialist or, is, I mean, anyone can submit something, uh, surely someone is verifying the information? Or? Yeah, we have, we make sure, we do it a collaborative editing okay. uh, with the, the yeah. person who submits the story and, uh, and we are, uh, 
you know, our purpose is, to, is for social justice too, so uh, our stories have to have an anti-oppressive, <laughs> um, they can't be oppressive in any right. way, and, okay. uh, but yeah, we have editors that will work with you to, uh, to turn your story uh, into a, a story that can be published, yeah, and possibly. so if, uh, if people are interested in um, becoming a, a journalist, we really encourage that because it, it's us, like we, need, we to need to tell our yeah, stories. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, and now we're going to be uh, talking with uh, uh, Janet Doucet, and you did mention earlier that uh, the be how beautiful the place mm -hmm. is here. And, and so, uh, Janet, you're the program coordinator at the uh, Daily Point Nature Reserve. Right. Um, you've been actively engaged in public awareness of con converse, uh, conservation issues for nine years or so. N nine years. So nine yeah, years. tell us about uh, about your work there, the programs, uh, and the the reserve itself. Sure. Yeah, well, uh, I work on the local level, but I work with a lot of provincial partners mm -hmm. uh, at the reserve. A little bit of history about the reserve. Uh, uh, it was the potential site for the smelter. Yes. So mm -hmm. the smelter would have been built there back in, in 66. Mm. But uh, there was a lot of foresight at the time, and so that never happened. Instead, there was a partnership that developed between Noranda Mining Company and the Department of Natural Resources. And they decided to uh, make it a nature reserve, conserve. There are a lot of people that, you know, uh, say, okay, what do we call it? Mm. Um, anyway, it's a place where we don't touch anything, basically. Trees fall down, uh, okay. you know, um, animals live there, uh, even animals die there, I don't remove any bodies. <laughs> the only thing that was missing at the time of the uh, inception of the nature reserve was there was no consultation with First Nations. Mm -hmm. So back in the 80s, I don't know if it's because that was um, not even thought about, uh, but since, I've, since my tenure, I've developed a partnership with First Nations okay. and a very strong partnership where, you know, no matter what we're doing uh, in terms of uh, activities there, we always acknowledge that this is unceded territory. Um, and that it does belong to them, and we're just borrowing it. So we treat it very respectfully. Oh, that's yeah. good. And which, um, uh, um, which group is it, or which... Um it belongs right now to the city of Bathurst who got it for the sum of a dollar from Naranda. I think it fell into their laps, whether they wanted it or not. Um, and for a long time, the uh, 44 hectares sort of, nothing was happening. Uh, there were no programs, uh, they didn't have the funds to hire a, a, a staff, any staff there. Um, and at one point uh, it was uh, conjectured that, well, you know, maybe we should uh, turn this into an RV park. And that's when the citizens uh, got upset. And uh, around 2005 they formed a commission to study the possibility of having, you know, an interpreter there and somebody to coordinate programs. And consequently, six years later, I was hired to do the programming there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you did mention uh, there's the Micmac Trail, I believe, that you, you yes. discussed, you talked about. Yes. Uh, and, and so um, the Mi'kmaq Trail, which runs from sky to sea, from Mount Carlton right to the Bathurst Harbor, since Daly Point is on the harbor, and there's land uh, across the way that sort of more or less connects to the NB Trail that connects to Mount Carlton, um, we sort of have a natural um, access to the Mi'kmaq Trail. So it is, the trailhead is there too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, to, also, you mentioned also, because we're going to be talking about this in the next vlog, mm -hmm. but you are maybe, I'm not sure if you started it or, but tell mm -hmm. us more about Four Directions. Oh, okay. Well, I'll segue over to the, yes. the socioeconomic benefits of... That uh, we'll be talking in the, in, yeah, in the next yeah. vlog. Yeah, I'm just something. here to give you a segue, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's right. okay. We have so, <laughs> So um, during my tenure there at Daily Point, um, I have done a lot of programming um, and environmental education and working with partners like Ducks Unlimited, Nature NB. I'm on the board of Nature NB. Um, but there was an element missing there. Um, you know, I, I remember Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, those groups being really active in terms of uh, giving kids an experiential adventure where they, uh, you know, had to sleep overnight and and cook over an open fire and those sort of, I think that element's missing, mm -hmm. that kind of initiation into the, into nature. Nature, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, 
so in one of my hikes on the Mi'kmaq Trail, um, uh, I, one day I met uh, a fellow hiker, a René Viennot, uh, and we started talking. And it was just phenomenal uh, how much uh, of a vision we shared about, you know, uh, doing this. And he was already involved with the Bathurst Youth Centre and a chap named Dino Simoni, uh, where they had taken kids out uh, on a survival week. And uh, we uh, decided to look into it together, so we pursued funding. We went with uh, the Réseau d'Inclusion, which were a big supporter uh, in that first year, and uh, find ourselves now in year three. Uh, the response was phenomenal, uh, enough so that we've decided to launch the program as its own um, nonprofit co-op, because we feel it has a better uh, opportunity to receive more funding. We're kind of limited as a municipality. Right. And I think you want to, if you have something that you're passionate about, you want to give it wings. Um, you know, so it's one of the first projects that we're launching from there. So um, youth age 12 to uh, 17 have a chance to go on multi-day uh, treks where not only do they learn the principles of outdoor survival, but they also learn some really uh, essential life skills that are transferable. You know, um, working in, in co-op with others, uh, uh, self-confidence, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. I said that one, teamwork. Um, you know, just having that, that um, being in touch with their peers, but also so with, with nature, nature and reconnecting. We actually have someone who will be here I with understand us. That. Yes, yeah, uh, who's had the joined. experience. Yes. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot going on uh, with that program, and I think it's a resurgence of that that reconnection yeah. that we need to see. Happen. Janet, thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you, Tracy, and as well, Céline and Susan. Much appreciated. On apprécie votre participation au Bloc 1. Thank you. It was great, very informative. And uh, we ask you to stay with us, and, uh, and we will be back. Good evening, Block 2. So we're talking about inclusion and social justice. So uh, on the stage, we have Julie Sinot. She's a coordinator, provincial coordinator of the uh, Economic and Social uh, Inclusion of New Brunswick. And it's called the CIES. No, not siesta, but... <laughs> and we also have with us uh, Jennifer Degg. She's the coordinator of the... Uh, Community uh, Chaleur Community Inclusion Network. And Zoe Leger, she uh, was a participant in one of the projects uh, you will mention later. And we, also, and we also mentioned it in the first blog. It's a four direction. So we will start uh, with Judy. Good evening. Thanks for being here and thanks uh, to. Uh, to for accepting uh, to participate. We will talk about uh, the uh, inclusion, uh, economic and social inclusion from New Brunswick. It's a Crown Corporation. It's not only a depart, uh, department. It's uh, really like uh, in, the, in the act. So, it, so there's an act on inclusion for, to, for poverty reduction and also for community inclusion. In fact, it was uh, developed 10 years ago. It was in, in an approach focused on public consultations. Now we are at our third uh, public con consultation, our uh, third plan of uh, poverty re uh, reduction. It should become in uh, place in New Brunswick. So the initial approach was was uh, to uh, remove the silos, but we seem to work with the with the uh, nonprofit organization or or government levels. But uh, we 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 thought like the the gap. We had the mandate to consult the citizen to know like what were their needs in terms of inclusion and poverty reduction. From this approach, like. Uh, we organize public uh, organization to develop a poverty reduction plan. So I will not uh, I'll use uh, the, the language or the jargon of it, but uh, we, we did provincial consultation to see the needs in 12 different regions in New Brunswick. 
And from this, while well, we had the priority action, so we are pay, uh, developing a provincial plan. So we had the participation of Gen. So we have two, 12 uh, community inclusion that are working really hard in their community to prepare projects like for directions, as we mentioned, but also to to organize projects that meets like the specific needs of the region. So often we're seeing like the needs from the south uh, are different from the ones in the needs of the north. So that's why we have this approach. So you mentioned like the uh, poverty reduction. It's a poverty reduction and help. I'm, I'm taking and help thousands of New Brunswick to become independent. Independent in the sense like economically. So we have several initiatives uh, for at the more at the government level like the reform for, we had a reform for on the income assistance. And we also had some uh, programs to help families uh, in need with uh, dental uh, and vision care. And also like we had specific programs developed within the regions. So each of the 12 regions for community inclusion, they have a budget envelope annually and they can put actions in place, not only to reduce uh, poverty, but also to plant a seed in the community that will uh, allow like our youth, like Zoe, they, they will uh, want to uh, flourish and stay in the region after, so to contribute to the so social and economic development in every region. So before you... You held the position of the coordinator, so you 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 know this very well. So you became the pro provincial coordinator. So it was a, a movement. It was like a progression. So congratulations. Now we could we want to discuss with Jennifer. Recently, I think la last year. Or so so you've been in place uh, for for almost a year. So she's a coordinator of the Chaleur uh, Community Inclusion Network. So you mentioned there's 12 uh, uh, networks. So we're talking about one specific region. I don't know which one of the two will talk about this, but it's still like the groups as the one that for Chaleur. So there's a board. So the way it's, it's managed yeah. So I have. Um, oh. So what we did, we we uh, we got people from the population, but from different sectors. So, so we have people who represent mental health, uh, social development. We have some who represent the citizen, post secondary education, uh, high school education. And we meet every three months, so we discuss the challenge also from the people who represent the bulk of the population, and we try to find some solutions. But it's always with uh, the information we collected, like uh, uh, during the public consultations in our region, and uh, from the from then you organize projects with those as a result or. After the public co uh, consultation, we develop a regional plan, and we look uh, what are the, the points for a, a provincial community action, and then we go back in our region, we try to see what are the challenges, and we're trying to, using the information we collected in our region. And I think earlier you mentioned this, we're talking about the networking for four sectors. That's where I'm going. You did uh, really good research. Government, business sector, and uh, non-government uh, agencies, the NGOs, and the citizens, as you mentioned earlier. So those uh, consultations, are they done in the, each for you like it's the Chaleur Community Inclusion Network. We did uh, public consultations 18 months ago. About, so the last one we did, and we went to five uh, places in our region. So we want to make sure we get uh, a big number of peoples at the regional level. So our region, 
we have also the linguistic aspect. So we did bilingual consultation. So we really went into the communities. So we covered the territory to make sure like uh, we got people from every uh, sphere. So the projects, <laughs> that's the fun part. So the project, uh, so the project, it, it's uh, my, my field. So we work with the incredible partners. Uh, I really, I have the best job in the world. So, so I, I asked the people, what is your dream? And we try to, to put this, this uh, make this dream a reality. So this evening, we have the uh, uh, on the pro project. It's a, we have a, a we work in partnership and also the back coordinator, and already there, like you were able to see a couple of them. We also deal with the with transportation, so the shala uh, like the and affordable uh, transportation, and now we're talking about uh, public uh, transportation. And you mentioned how many, there's several uh, uh, components, <laughs> component, yeah. It, it's like the magic bus. <laughs> so we have, it does, uh, it's two things, one, what they do. It travels, it, it picks up people like uh, with their uh, mobility problems to bring them to appointments and social activities. So that's the inclusion part. And we made a partnership with, uh, with the uh, downtown entrepreneur hotels and the retailers. And during the weekends that night, they bring, they get people from hotels, they bring them downtown. It takes about uh, one hour and it's free, especially in the winter. And these are snowmobilers, and in the summer, it's, you can visit there also. It's for the touristic, uh, tourist clientele. So it sees like, so what the relationship between like the businesses in the region and the inclusion. So they, they pay for this service because they all contributed to this, so we picked them up. So then we, we can continue with the prog program. But, uh, in which we help like uh, uh, people who need transportation for their uh, medical appointments or social activities, just to give you an idea. So in the Shala region over the last year, 5,600 uh, uh, trips that were done for uh, medical appointments to um, do your grocery, go to the bank, or job-related activities, and it's all managed by volunteers. So these uh, people uh, volunteer, they bring people for free. Otherwise, they would not have access to transportation on the territory. So it's part of the plan for poverty reduction and for New Brunswick. So we really need like more like a trans public transportation, especially in northern uh, New Brunswick. 5,600 uh, trips. And you also had another project. So it's a it's also a food uh, security. We have uh, Eat Fresh, so we buy uh, fruits and vegetables from uh, grocery stores. We we uh, prepare bags, like uh, they have a value of $30, $40 worth of products. So when we have it at a reduced price, we sell them in our community at, for $15 a bag. It's a, m a monthly basis. It's for two. We try to avoid any stigma. So these programs or projects and initiatives is for them. We do not target one group in particular. It's open to everyone. And we just uh, uh, welcome a, a new uh, a coordinator for uh, food uh, uh, safety. In our street. And he will develop also uh, other projects for food safety also to have good food how to prepare it, how to eat well, and possibly how to grow your food. Is it the, it's done all year round, this project. So where's, where is it based? We have a center at Kingsbend also, so that's where they pack those bags. And we distribute all over the region. So we had nine. I have like a, we have a Facebook page, you can see. 
and you pay your bag in advance and you receive it the month after. So th th there's no waste. Even like for the pr uh, eating fresh project, other than the boxes, the fruit, there's no, no, no weight. Do not use plastic. It's all like reusable containers. If we have to put anything in the bags, these are paper bags, so there's no plastic, almost no waste. So the information for people watching us, so they could get the information or even subscribe. Do you have to subscribe? So you can subscribe and you can see also Eat Fresh Shala on our Facebook page and they have all the information for the distribution center. Now we will talk about... We will talk. We have talked about it in the first block. We know how this started. But let's go a bit more details. The different initiatives, there's uh, four as four points to it. Uh, four directions for want to get information. So, the four uh, directions, as uh, Zoe mentioned, these, uh, you know, there are initiatives in the region, it may come from, uh, these are really people from the grassroots in the area, this, uh, the need uh, to go out with uh, young people to integrate them, so they say, okay, uh, there's something to be done. They have to know what what they have, what's available. So it uh, gives them a taste protective environment, uh, survival. Uh, yeah, Zoe is the expert in this. We'll talk about that with her. But the goal is to develop some capacities, some skills uh, with uh, young people. So the age group is 12 to 17 years old, so their activities two, three, five days, they come back to the community, so every uh, year they do some cleanup in the Mi'kmaq Trail, but it's not just picking up waste, but they cut wood, they take out fallen trees, they really maintain the trail, but they're supervised in doing so. There are people working with them to do this. And the forest, so this initiative, which is funded by, by the CIA, by the CIS, and uh, she will talk about the more interesting part. So we are kind of the starting agency, if you will. We have to provide the seed money to invest in the project, to encourage the model. So it could be businesses, uh, non-profits, uh, volunteers. So we want people to build around uh, this or that concept. And at the Provincial vote is a great success for each dollar. CS invested the super Chalar community has invested fourteen dollars for that one dollar. So it's really a win-win. It's, it's a great success. We talked about it before that we need to inform people about these things. Uh, we want to demonstrate the uh, things that are being done here. So that's a good way to uh, use this with the SPAS management to inform people. So now we'll talk with Zoe Lejean. You took part and I would like to know to start uh, your, your in that age group of uh, <laughs> at 12 years old. <laughs> Is that true? So you'll be uh, five, five years yet to come with this. Uh, the so I'm not the one to think uh, so that you're, uh, if you've already got a certain amount of experience, uh, you've done this several times. Uh, this year will be the fourth year. 
12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 12 So the uh, direction camp, uh, we, we uh, have uh, people to help with safety, coordination and whatever, but the direction uh, camp is at uh, 10 uh, Venables and uh, a mother uh, of, of uh, Zoe is here, she's part of the volunteers who are involved. So when volunteers come, we allow them to bring their children. So they're, from there you got the experience and so on. So they, uh, so it's not the first time. So tell, tell us about your experience. So with Co-Direction, uh, that from my uh, first time was Survival Week. We learn uh, first aid, uh, how to light a fire. If somebody gets lost in the wood, uh, how to bring, build a shelter. So you're really in the woods. Uh, it's not a uh, pretend. Uh, no, you're really into it. So where years we walked through the woods. Last year we did some study. We uh, uh, went in, on the river as well. So you do different things. We talk about uh, uh, people supervising how many young people, depending on the years, sometimes we're 15 to 20, something sometimes 10 to 13, it may vary in terms of numbers. So it takes several adults, right? Uh, or some adults uh, to supervise. So with your experience, how many adults were there? How did it work out? About six adults, my mother involved as well. And when we're in the woods together, we're all included. We're all, uh, maybe some people are less fortunate, uh, but we're in the woods, we're all equal. We're all equal, even with the adults during that survival week. So your uh, social status is not important. Everybody is equal. Everybody is the same. So a week, uh, this experience, five days. Uh, so you take off and uh, you go into the woods. So you learned a lot of things, of course, in five days. Uh, what did that uh, bring you, uh, bring to you personally? How did it affect you? You know, survival in the forest, building fire, but how do you feel now that you've done those experiences? I feel more confident because you, you uh, work by yourself, you develop yourself, uh, and with adults, uh, you create a connection. And when you're today's society, technology, you might not have that link with adults. I thought it was very important. Uh, is it uh, transferable? Uh, you were with adults in that situation and you come back in uh, uh, day to day life. Are you able to, uh, uh, in different ways, it help you in uh, real life? Yes, I think we communicate more easily, less arguments. You know, sometimes we argue uh, on the same thing, so that uh, makes it different. Uh, tell us a bit about you know, more self-confidence, you develop skills, like in the school, uh, the feeling of having succeeded uh, something, so that's accomplishment, uh, yes, except in school it helps quite a bit, uh, it shows you, wow, is nature is beautiful, uh, uh, surviving without technology for five days. And when you're in school or at home, you say, oh, okay, today I want to go outside, see nature again, uh, you know. So, yes, you're right. 
So you're 12 years old, and so you're still going to be five years uh, yet to go. So what are your goals? Uh, and with uh, Count Direction, you want to continue? Yes, I want to be in, continue to be involved with it and to be uh, devoted, yet you become a resource. And you can show others. And that's great. So have you influenced some of your friends, uh, some of your peers? But so you tell me this, you, there are people that you knew in the group? Or my first time, uh, uh, after the second day, we all knew each other. There were strangers before, but we, we got to know each other around the fire. And uh, you talk about this in your circle of friends? Uh, yes, several wanted to do it again. Uh, you, we, once you go, once you really want to do a lot of publicity for it, uh, because you want to encourage other people to go. Yes, everybody should live it. So some friends took part. So what's the next one? What's the next outing? Uh, we haven't. We don't know the exact dates between July and August. Usually in the summer. No, year round. Uh, but if you allow me, there's an activity in March. They will build a type of igloo. My, uh, took some took part last year. It was minus 20. So the uh, young people uh, built uh, uh, that uh, shelter. They slept in there. It was never uh, above minus four. This being said, when we see uh, everybody can take part, it's free. I send my uh, <laughs> my children there with their bags and they get there they put their stuff in the bag and to go hide their hiking they need they have everything they need the meals and so on so yes they can into in hand uh, so in terms of inclusion there might have been some people that didn't have the same means uh, to do this so it's free so, yeah, we don't want to make any distinction between poor or uh, better off or whatever. So, everybody has potential, so we want to develop that. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe, for taking part. So, it went well. The first uh, participation uh, this, uh, yes, that was great. Thank you to the both of you as well. Continue the beautiful work, the good work. Alors, on est de retour dans quelques minutes. Welcome to the third and last block of the Spas Masterim show. We'll talk about sustainable economic development. So in this block, we're now uh, looking to the future. So with us today, we have uh, Jean-Baptiste Roy, uh, so La Barque uh, founding member, René Wachy. He's going to talk about sustainable economic development. And Denis Caron, who is the uh, CEO of the uh, Port of Beldune. So we're privileged uh, to have Mr. Caron with us this evening. Welcome. And welcome to thank you for the three of you. So we'll start with Mr. Asher. <laughs> So, you have a vision of a sustainable economic development. So, tell us about your journey that brought you to thinking about wanting to work on this, on sustainable economic development. Uh, and perhaps to define this. Uh, several years ago, I undertook uh, some studies in environment. Uh, those studies give me a tool 
to watch nature, to understand. Uh, 40 years ago, here in the Schiller Bay, I did some work with uh, my uncle Romeo. It was coming to fish, cod, that was this big in the bay. And this is real, yeah, this is not a fisherman tale. We know today it's not as it was. So, as we talked about today, the actions that we take have an, Im an impact in the short, middle, and long term. So, when we talk about sustainable development, we talked about two ideas, development, uh, and that's economic development, but also about the sustainable part. The idea is to maintain something in a permanent uh, way. So when we talk about sustainable development and economic uh, development, there's three aspects, like mean, any uh, aspect uh, of the economic development. Uh, so environment, uh, what are the impacts of businesses on the environment in the mid and long term? This is the com social component, which is linked to the well-being of workers. But there's sustainable development, uh, 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 condition of the business, uh, conditions they offer to the employees. And thirdly, the economic aspect. Uh, the economic impacts, uh, so the three pillars, if you will, environment, social, and economic. So in the discussion we had, we talked about uh, so uh, uh, sustainable businesses increasing the uh, capacity of existing businesses. This is an opportunity we have in our new world. We can talk a lot about opportunities. Uh, here, it, the northern part of the province is well positioned to uh, give itself that identity of businesses that are focused on and well placed to do sustainable development. So that's increasing capacity of businesses to recognize their impacts, to document them, and to communicate what they do to uh, aim for uh, uh, sustainable environment. So there's an, a business, uh, an opportunity here to take the to take uh, the right turn towards uh, a sustainable environment and sustainable development uh, to put businesses in a way in a situation where they can play the role of being of being responsible to uh, give them the tools to develop, to become leaders in our area, to foster uh, sustainable development, but also to set up a hub of businesses that would help us develop that identity. And this is something uh, you had talked about, uh, so regional identity. The potential exists of creating that identity in Northern New Brunswick, where we would be recognized at the level of province and Canada and so on, would be recognized as a region that take, took the turn towards a sustainable environment uh, development. So the next question uh, is for those people, those business people who would be interesting. Is there support to do uh, take this uh, turn? Uh, I wouldn't say that the support is already existing, but there are mechanisms and capacities. Uh, funders, organizations have some leverage uh, to do this, to take uh, that turn, uh, as you're saying, to go in that direction, building capacity, recognize the impacts, uh, to document uh, the impacts, document the actions, and communicate uh, those. So that's clear to me. Thank you. So I'll talk. Uh, uh, so your storyteller, uh, storyteller, you, I ask you, Jean Baptiste, uh, to maybe the story of La Barque here. I think it was a model in the community about for resilience for development, 
sustainable economic development. Uh, so when the school point vert announced that we were closing their doors, so a group of citizens uh, uh, took the initiative of do something, doing something with it. You're one of the founding members of this Labar Co-op. To really tell this story, we have to go before the closure of the school. So I can tell you that uh, I was getting ready for retirement. Uh, I'd always had in mind, what will I do in retirement? So I wanted to transfer my knowledge. So I was mulling this over. I was trying to get the message out to other people that it would be important that we can have in the northern part of New Brunswick, in the Chaleur region especially, a place where people could meet and to verbalize, uh, socialize, and around a group that could do uh, woodwork. Uh, so I wasn't uh, much listened to. Th that was something of a dream for people. And my mother had said, you can dream about what you want, but I'm not sure if it'll happen. So I had the chance of being invited to build a boat, a Terra Nova boat, for Euclid Chasson, who's the chair. Uh, the present chair of the Labarque uh, co-op. So I agreed because working the wood, wood is really, uh, I really like it. So to get into this garage to build the boat the second day, I started to the planning. Uh, uh, he was keen. He would invite people to come and see my work. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, bragging. <laughs> Maybe I'm bragging, as I said before. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to uh, to uh, reduce that a bit. I said, this is the time to talk about my project. I said, we should develop a community woodworking workshop where people could meet. I, they really, he really believed, they really believed in what I wanted to propose. This was more tangible. So from there we kept talking. I did some research in the Chalet region from Bathurst and up, you know, buildings where there could be uh, that uh, wood workshop, but it was not affordable for somebody retiring. Uh, so one day I got into a kid's garage, there were four or five people there, and I said, I found the place for it. I said, well, let's stop it right away. Let's go look at it. And he said, it's the school. Uh, the uh, students are going to be moved to another school, and that's going to be free. So I said, yeah, that's, are you serious? Uh, so we came to visit. When we visited this, look, we're inside the school. Nothing has changed since we came here, except from some painting and so on. So the project took off. However, the uh, wood workshop uh, took more time to develop than the rest of the activities. Uh, and that's normal because that's uh, quite uh, a lot of requirements. So yeah, it, it, it took money at about a hundred uh, grand uh, investment. So that's where the idea took off. Uh, we went to get in the Chile region. People had a similar uh, way of thinking in terms of a co-op to try to address how we would go about this. So the idea of the co-op uh, was one of the ideas that was that came out of that group. And we can see the, uh, how this re resurgence this, uh, uh, from this initiative. La Barque is the uh, name of the boat that we built. And says, uh, Abark, let's get in together, we'll roam. So it was kind of a, 
You know, a flower garden. All the ideas came from all different sides and too fast, uh, too fast for us to manage. So was it the happy happenstance, uh, you know, from institutes, uh, uh, business institutes, they came from all different uh, directions to help us, you know, we could man manage it uh, at that point. Uh, so we had meetings uh, within the Shala region, all municipalities, uh, to show our vision towards what we wanted to develop from Bathurst over to Shalvo. And so now you're over 1,000, 1,050 members. They trusted uh, each other. One person paid 25 bucks to be a member that they didn't know what would uh, happen. So, well, if you're a member, I'll be a member. So, uh, 1,052 people paid 25 bucks each to have a trust uh, to an institute that would be there for quite a while. That was the idea, is the sustainability in itself there to uh, give an overview of La Barque. Uh, some things you had mentioned, but uh, there's also training. So it's really your uh, co-op to help community. There are courses uh, given yoga, painting, and so on. I wanted to make sure that the people that listen to us can go to your site and your internet site you have uh, information newsletters uh, how to become members uh, and so they go in la barque la barque co-op uh, .org and they'll have the information to register as a member online and to have information about what's happening in La Barque. We could mention as well, if I may, there are 35 different activities that's happening within this building here. So we didn't create a need, we filled a need. And that's what we have to f uh, show. So it's a very good example of resilience, of looking forward to take action. Uh, you know, it, I think uh, La Barque is also an example. It's, it's a very good example in the province. It's a unique uh, project. I don't think we've seen it elsewhere. In doing this, what is called so, I wanted us to share this. It's a very good success. So thank you for telling us about it. About the executive director of the Beldun Port, and it's a pride for a northeastern the Shadow uh, region. So you are you are uh, managing like the port since 2015, and, and you and you are familiar with the economy economic development, like prior to your, your current position, you were involved also in, I've been at the port with the port for four years, and before I was in Fredericton, that's where I did most of my career. I retired like four years ago as the Deputy Minister of Economic Development, and I was also a Deputy Minister for Environment and other departments. I'm from Camelton, so I wanted to come to come back here with my uh, spouse and I wanted also to uh, to uh, get back to know back my uh, family and uh, friends and I wanted to give back to the community so when you work outside your area especially in my case I lived in Fredericton and we're part of a community but it's not really our community so it was always uh, my goal to come back and get involved to the uh, with the community. Just to put you in context with the Port of Beldun and also to look, because we're trying to look for the future. So we will talk about the uh, Port of Beldun. It was built in 1968 to meet the needs for transportation, 
for what we call for heavy industries. At the time, it was the mine, the smelter. So that that was the reason. It was the first reason. It was especially for for the smelter. And uh, what was used, uh, it, it was sent uh, to uh, other market, and we had also the forest industry, and the pulp and paper uh, industry, and we had several uh, plants also, the lousy batters, uh, miramichi, atolvis, all pulp and paper industries, plants, so they were all uh, present. So the port was uh, created in 1968, so we uh, celebrated uh, our 50th anniversary in 2018, and then the port uh, with the uh, closures. So there was a, changes, a change over the years. So we did terminals, I think you started with one and now we are at four, but still, to change uh, the direction, and now it's the economic development uh, motor also, the Port of Belden. It's something we mentioned earlier. So we have tools for economic development here like the, and we do not necessarily use them to their full uh, capacity. For example, like the, the port, uh, it runs at 30% of the capacity. However, for this the last four or five years, we double our volume. We had our best year in the history of the port was in 2018. So we really diversify our products. So we export and import the products. So it's not only like a port like Halifax or Montreal or Vancouver, where it's really like a product I was, it's, we receive more natural resources. We receive uh, salt from Maroc, a perlite from Greece. Uh, we export uh, wood chips to China. We export uh, uh, chips also in England. So we're really like uh, global. And uh, we have the opportunity to, to reach uh, the world. Like uh, It's very important for it as a tool. And we also mentioned like the biomass a product. So these are part of since for four, for four or five years, we have three suppliers. So they give like the industrial uh, uh, wood chip pellets. So it's in earth, so they're mixed with uh, coal in, in the neutral uh, power plant, so to make energy. So curiously, we could do the same, like right besides it. <laughs> I do, not, I, I do not want to get involved in <laughs> mine. Uh, so I, I think some discussions are probably uh, done. So we're in discussion, and we have three uh, and f or four other projects we're working on. So we uh, talked like the block. First block was environment protection. So the port of Belden, I was like the sea. Did you... Did, did you face uh, some issues because of climate change or so that the port uh, may be like the sea to, to raise uh, the, the, because of the sea level rise? Well, because of climate change, there, there are some impact. Uh, well, one example for now, we have a, a 40 million expansion and the terminals are too low. So compared to to uh, 10, uh, 25 years ago, we were they were high enough. So we had to increase the height because of, of one meter. So it, it it has a direct impact, and we recognize it, and we prepare us, ourselves accordingly. And of course, uh, there's uh, other aspects. We part of the green marine, so. So it's an international designation in terms of our operations that we will work. And uh, so these are the standards and the practices that we, we have to do. So we are, we are maybe leaders of the industry. Absolutely. So there's one aspect. So before we talk, to the, I want to mention like the, the site for the Port of Belden. It, there's a lot of information, really well done. And if I'm in Port of Belden, Port de Belden, so if you do it like on the research uh, engine, well, you could, and I, and I look, I saw, and I, and, 
but we have to mention it's it's a it's a protocol of engagement and consultations. I will let you uh, talk about this, but for now, like the port is on the uh, unceded territory, so we're discussing it like in the media. It's like a, it's just like a coincidence, but it's it's what's happening. So you had the uh, port of Belduin, so we did this protocol, and it's uh, on the website. And the PDF document is there. So can you explain a little bit? So when I came in, so we had uh, some products, and we had uh, uh, oil from uh, West. So so we had opportunities to export it from Beldoun. It was done mostly by train. So when I came uh, to, we had uh, the Distigush community, so they were opposed to this project. However, let's say all, we all got like the permits and the, and the Canadian National CN they did not necessarily define which road they would take because in New Brunswick, like there's two railway roads. We have the Matapedia Valley, Rimouski, Camelton, Beldun, or or the one going from Edmonston, Moncton, 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 Beldun. So we have like two railways. Unfortunately, like the CN did not want to say which roads. So the first uh, distinguished first relation opposed the project. So when I came in, I said like we have to establish a relationship with, with the First Nation, our neighbors, and I lived the same experience when we were when I was working for the provincial government, and we did not necessarily do a good job then. So it was really a, a question of, of working uh, to get and meet uh, with uh, these uh, individuals and explain also the port, our projects, our intentions, and also like to develop a, a relationship of based on trust and to make sure we could do the development together. So we started this process. And 14 months after, we had a protocol with eight First Nations of Mi'kmaq, essentially in New Brunswick and on the eastern coast. In Gaspé Coast, there's three Mi'kmaq community, so we are working closely with them to have the same protocol. But the protocol is not complicated. It's everyone who wants to go to, go to the Beldun, deal with the Beldun port, has to sign an agreement, and with this agreement, they will present their project with all the information for the First Nation. We we put we set aside a hundred thousand dollars, what we call like like a technical capacity, because it's not everyone like the have access to engineer or a, a chemistry professionals or. We have a hundred thousand dollars per year, so the so First Nation can uh, also use like to do a project assessment. So it's one of the aspects, but the other aspect is all the economic component. It's to offer opportunities, either like for jobs or for uh, possible control. So we have an Aboriginal company. We, we deliver uh, some of those products ducks by truck through the Pabino Reserve. So it's really to encourage this type of development. And also what I saw on the website, you are proud to be really anchored in the community. And I'm and I found it very interesting because the previous blog was talking about inclusion, community inclusion, and, and you are offered also a, a student bursaries. So we give back to the community 5% of our profits. So so last year it was $150,000. So, so in 2018, it was our best year uh, in the port's history. So we had uh, 3 million of the metric ton of products, either exported or imported. So, so we made 3 million of profit. So uh, almost one dollar per ton. So we give back to the uh, community five percent of our profits. So for different, uh, different projects. These are great news, and it has to be shared. So that's why, like the own project and the Espace Maritime, it's a platform really to, 
to inform uh, the population on those success stories and to end. There's a note also. So the uh, port administration of Belden was created uh, uh, here. Uh, before, pre previously, it was uh, managed uh, by Ottawa because it's a federal jurisdiction. And since uh, 2000, so the, it, it's uh, managed from here. In 2000, like the port was transferred locally, so we, we manage like, the terminals. They still belong to the federal government, but over the year, like, we, we we required a lot of land for future development. But the board the, are people from here. So we have seven members on the board from Caraquet to Camelton. So it's really north, northeastern New Brunswick. So they understand the region. So in terms of participation projects, plan, strategic planning, we, we have uh, a, a impressive involvement from uh, the population. So it really shows that like, the decentralization works because that, that's how we can make things go forward in our region. Because we have the, the experts, we have people interested. And I find it very interesting because I cannot see people in, in the room, but how many people uh, came to, to visit the port? Very few people came in. We do not uh, talk about it. In the, we, we bought like a 15-passenger van just to do the tours like at the port. So people can go on the website because the port belongs to everyone. And it's a great project for a sustainable eco economic development. So we had we had the back court. It was a great project from sustainable development, and we had also the great words of Renaud Haché. It's it's more clear like what is the sustainable economic development because everybody talks about it. Mr. Caron, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. So this ends our our uh, third uh, segment and last segment of our show.